uh, I was at a party once at Burning Man at this uh, party called Jub Jub, and I was sitting next to these two beautiful women, and they're talking, and I was sort of talking to them too, and then all of a sudden they like they leaned over me and started to make out, and I was like, oh okay, this is <laughs> going just the way I wanted it to, and then and then they 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 collapse on top of me and they start having like sixty nining on top of, like fucking each other, and I I start to reach in to go you know like in my yeah. default position as a man like this is. This is I'm this is an invitation. And as my <laughs> hands go towards them, I have this like secondary realization. I was like, "Oh no. They're not inviting me. I'm not I'm not, I'm just uh furniture or like I'm, this is listen it's a lucky seat don't get me wrong i'm lucky to be here but i realized like this isn't for me this is on top of me but i'm not invited and so i just sort of respectfully sat there allowed them to do their thing they finished and then i got up and i never washed those pants again that's really funny because imagine the girls retelling that story yeah. and they're like we tried to have a <laughs> and then so he scared. just acted like a chair <laughs> We are so blessed today to have an Emmy Award winner in our midst. It's uh, Moshe Kasher. He's a comedian and uh, just a hilarious guy. And Naveen and I have been watching his podcast religiously. That's Every so night. Cool. Every really? night we watch it. We never watch like the older episodes, so it's been fun because now I get to watch everything. Oh, you're catching up. Yeah. Do you guys watch it and then ML? Make love? We do it during. Oh, during? Yeah. Every single time? Mm -hmm. No, sometimes we have to shut yeah. the computer off, and then, then we get back to it. Honestly, not to get into your sex life, but there is something fun about sex where you laugh in the middle. <laughs> you know? Where you can laugh a little bit, and then you get back to the business at hand. Because this is kind of an inherently absurd act. I don't laugh in the middle of most. No, you're very serious? No, I'm dead serious. So I'm there serious. to get the right? job yeah, done. Yeah, yeah. You make, I heard, unrelenting eye contact and whisper I, I love you the to. entire time. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 Great. That's a really to. nice. And this one, oh my God, it goes on and on and on and on. You know, you and I, we, we can come once and that's it. And then- Jason. The, the Why you and I? Why are you? Why am I being limp? Why well, you're a man. This? You're a man. You, you haven't seen go. me in years, dude. I might have changed. You don't go. You don't go twice in a night. It's been a you're while. You're 44 years Listen, old. Listen, it's been a while. You can't go twice in a night, can you? He's like, prove it. No, I. you're right. I mean, listen, you're right. I just well, When know. I met her, I stopped masturbating. That's beautiful. Because no, I, no I don't, I don't, so I don't have the goods. So why does the bed shake in the middle of the night when I sleep early? <laughs> 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 no, I, I had to. I, I, I have to keep everything uh, available. and as, I had to be stocked. What's that? You... I, I have to be stocked up. Oh, stop. You mean... <laughs> You do it a little bit to build it up? No, no, no. What I mean is most, I mean, I can't afford to waste any bullets uh, I, at my age. And I obviously, hear you. we have an age difference here. You uh, think that you might run out eventually? Is that, you think you <laughs> might get to the, the edge? De Niro just had a kid, man. No, no. She goes out to Target, right? Sure. And I'm by myself. I can't go in there and start wanking it off. Because oh, because then you'll be out for the night. I'll be out. Yeah. I'll be done. I hear that. I hear yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can tell when you have, though, because you'll be like, like right now? <laughs> oh yeah, like, he's like super calm like too. He's no, not interested, but he's yeah. very he's calm. Like, oh, I, I could right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's all things are possible. I mean, life is long. No, that barely ever happens. Tell them how. Tell him how. It's, it's I never happened. Please tell he, me how. He always. Jason. Please tell him. He always performs. That's. The, the, I, this is what I was hoping we'd talk about when <laughs> yeah, I drove over. I know what, that's why I wanted you here to talk yeah. about my session because your your podcast is an advice podcast. Yeah, it's like a relationship advice podcast, sort of. We we open it up too to generalized advice. Well, I like when you guys talk in the beginning, just yeah. you two, and then when you bring the advice. And did you feel did you feel uh, nervous being like, okay, I'm going to give people advice? Did you feel like, am I worthy to give strangers advice? Well, you know, I we started this. We started our our podcast based on a tour that we were doing, and ah. the tour was just based on we were trying to hack the system, which is as you know. The, the worst part of stand-up is just being, like, lonely on the road. And when you get into a relationship, I mean, I'm not a drinker. Yeah, I haven't I know. been a drinker since I was a little, like, a teenager. Yes. And so what I had was I had sex, and then I got married, and then I realized, wow, the road is... It is boring out there. Yeah. Like I'm just I'm on stage having fun, and then after I just am in my bed eating chips, watching Netflix. So Natasha and I thought, 
and I'm away from my family. Yeah. So then Natasha and I thought, oh, let's we could hack the system. We could co-headline, and then we got to find a third act, basically, yeah. where she does a little, I do a little, and then we'll find a third act. So we just started bringing couples up on stage and giving them advice. Uh. But on stage, you're just making fun of people because there's no expectation to be kind or helpful. It's just like bang, bang, roast, roast, good night. Yeah. And then we started this podcast, and it was like, this feels a lot meaner in a podcast format <laughs> to just make fun of people. So then we're like, okay, let's try to be sincere mm. uh, and give people real advice. And that's, I feel like, when the podcast really started to blossom and take off was when people were coming to us with real stuff and we were being as real as we could. We're not experts. We don't pretend to be like uh, yeah. experts. But I think that my – Natasha's got a lot of wisdom. Yes, uh, she She's does. a really wise woman. And I, you know, I, like I said, was in – in and out of rehab and therapy my entire teenage years and got sober super young. So I have some of that there. Uh -huh. um, but mostly I like, it's a lot of young people calling in and they're like sort of mommy and mommy zaddy help us. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. A lot, I, we saw one girl, she, she was asking like a lot of questions that were pretty obvious. She was like, can I just go ask a guy out? Well, that's what I'm <laughs> and saying. And you were like, yeah, you can. <laughs> you see very quickly how lost so many people are. Yeah. So many people are so lost. I mean, not just about relationships, but about life. Like people are out there, they are bumbling. Yeah, yeah, they and are. And if I can take that bumble and turn it into content. <laughs> Speaking of Bumble, can you uh, <laughs> Our advertise on the Endless Honeymoon Bumble podcast? Uh, I, yeah, I, uh, well, I remember when I was that age, when I was in my 20s. You're, you're, you're absolutely lost in your 20s. Oh, I mean, you have no answers. I was a little bit different in my 20s. Not that I had the answers. Actually, I really thought I had the answers in my <laughs> I 20s. I think you do. Because I had been sober uh, five years and and thought that I had kind of figured everything out. Right. Um, so I so it wasn't until I was like thirty that I realized, oh, I actually don't know shit. And then I started yeah. figuring out how to like actually live. Yeah, 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 yeah. What do you What do you like about the show? About endless honeymoon. Yeah. This is awesome, by the um, way. I, I thought we were just coming yeah. to a regular podcast. This we're is like, Plug we City are, right we're here. Fans. Fans. I told her yesterday. I was driving in the car. I go. I go. Moshe's coming tomorrow, and she goes. <gasps> I was like, can, can I? Like that? I go, Moshe's coming. And I go, and I go, do you want to sit in with us? Oh, and she goes, oh, so this is a rare treat. Can I? This is a rare treat? I, I, she does I the podcast a lot. This is nice. I, you know, sometimes I'm like, yeah, I'll skip that one. I'll skip that one. I say no. We had Annie on. That's another one I she love loves. when Annie's on. Yeah. Annie Lederman. Oh, well, so. I feel like, I feel like I'm very honored that you were so excited to be here. I feel like I should try to troubleshoot uh, one of your relationship <laughs> Let's problems. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. It feels like the only right Expert. thing to do. Oh my God. Now, you know, Let's he see. does have some cred. He's been doing it for four years. Yeah. L LFG. So he's seen it all. LFG is the young people say that call in. I love when you, I love Let's when you. Let's freaking go. That's what they mean. <laughs> Let's run, th run through. The, you know, he's an expert at um, at Gen Z slang. Oh yeah, oh, yeah I really? Do know a lot that's of like your thing. That's some a, Gen Z slang. What are we it's like what on? I find cool <laughs> is when a guy my age knows all the Gen Z slang. Yeah, you know, I think that's cool. And who you know who respects it? The Gen, kids. Gen Z. I mean, yeah, they're like, they oh, this it. guy gets it. He's one of us. He's <laughs> yeah. still current. He's 100%. relevant. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. You you 100%. feel that? Let's yeah. see. Yeah. It's my guy right here, actually. Bitch. <laughs> See that? Even just saying that this is my guy, that was really sincere and genuine. I feel connected to you right now. Yeah, and we just I feel today. so connected to you too. Yeah. How old are you, Mitch? Twenty-five. Oh, oh yeah! Wow, perfect. That, so I can fact check. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Actually, <laughs> and then when you fact checks, I'll, I'll be like facts. Exactly. I'll point at the fact check and I'll go facts. This but, guy knows. Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, wait, my my daughter says uh, that goes hard. It goes hard, yeah, sure. It goes hard. Or if uh, this, these, uh, the, she'll say the food is bussin'. No, no, no. Yeah. She says bus now. Oh, oh it's, it's bus. bus. She cut oh. The I didn't know. Oh, yeah, yeah. oh maybe we're, I'm losing my connection here. I've, well, I feel like maybe I'm even now teetering on the edge of not knowing because that's new to yeah, me. Yeah, she don't told know about me bus. you can't say bussin'. Oh, oh bussin'? She here's, said it's oh. bus. Here's the reality. Here's how you know a, a slang term has died. And it was true uh, like when I was young, too. When... When mom started saying da bomb, it, like it was like okay, well, that's done. Okay, we're done with da bomb. With da bomb. And so yeah, as the minute you were saying is bussin', your daughter was like, I can't say that anymore. Yeah, bus. She cut it. I'm on the bus now. Yeah, I played the song rap snitches the other day. Uh huh. And I was taught, I was live streaming, and I said, told my son, I said, like, I put, I played your favorite song, and I said, this is my favorite song, my son's favorite song, and he was like. It's not his favorite song anymore. He's now. like, ah, oh, he's like, that song is like a meme. Like, oh, it's like lame. That yeah, you he's even like, that song's like been memed it. like so many times. So why did you say that? And I was like, 
Oh, I thought it was like a really cool I song. This was like the coolest, most contemporary <laughs> song there was. Do you know Rap Snitches? I don't, MF I, Doom. You seem like the kind know, of guy with, that would know MF Doom. I know Doom. who MF Doom is. You do, yeah. yeah, yeah, the, yeah, ma- yeah. the masked rapper. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. Okay, let's give him a problem. Okay. A problem we have? Yeah. Um, what do you guys fight about the most? So a problem we have is I'm really positive mm. and Jason's trying. <laughs> but I feel that sometimes he is like a secret. Like when he gets in the car, sometimes I can hear him when he comes in upstairs and he'll be like, fuck. Mm. And then he'll be like, hi, honey, I'm home. Well, oh, let's have a good day today. Yeah. And I'm like, it's okay if you're upset, but don't like relish in it. On I some do. level, this is on you because you think it's me. <laughs> well, on some level, you married a comedian. It's like, what did you think was going to happen? There's no comedian that doesn't come home going, fuck. Fuck. That's really? the, the, you know, like hi, honey, I'm home. That's yeah. our. That's our. Ours is fuck. Yes, yes. <laughs> I used to have. I have a friend, Mo Mandela. Used to have a joke. He goes, "You ever wake up? You go like fuck." And they're like, "What's wrong?" You're like, "I don't know yet." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's him. That is me. He but wakes I, up. He's like another fucking day. We're gonna have a good day today, sweetie. <laughs> but yeah. that's hard. I I I struggle with that too. In my marriage, I I would say Natasha is the is the gloomer more than me. Yeah. I, I have a more of a positive outlook on life. I'm not a uh, an optimist, but I'm I'm like a um, I'm like a day to day. Let's keep this, you know, PMA going on. Mm-hmm. Positive mental attitude. Oh, but that's what I'm trying to, to to live in. Here's a problem I have. Yeah. So we go out, and she looks fabulous all yeah. the time. That is, is no, that sucks. Wait, that's that's hard. Sucks. That's no, hard. I, I'm appreciative of that. Mm-hmm. Believe me, she looks great. And then it's just like she's cold. I look oh, ugly cold. in a sweater. It okay. makes me look like a refrigerator. I swear so to God. What should I do? Should I bring two jackets everywhere I go? Okay, well, this is a Bay, this is Bay Area wisdom. You never leave the house in the. I'm from the Bay. Yeah, I know. You never leave, and L A L A people they have there's something wrong with them when it comes to weather. They don't understand. You never leave the house without a hoodie. You just never do it. Just always put it. Put, have a little. You know a what you hoodie? do? Listen, listen. You look beautiful. Just get one of those little purses Thank you. and a little crinkly <laughs> one of them little crinkly jackets. Stuff it, and you have to carry it. So if your if your problem is that yeah. she, you don't like when she gets cold, and your problem is you don't want to walk around with some ugly refrigerator hoodie, then you carry the, carry hoodie. the hoodie. It's hoodie. your job now to carry yep. the hoodie. And then the minute she says I'm cold, you fucking toss it on her but like here's a the matador. Problem. Yes, yes. <laughs> I don't want to wear the sweater. Mm-hmm. We I'll went, be cold. We I'll went to volleyball. Cold. We went to my daughter's volleyball match in the OC. Saturday. Oh, I, was I thought that get... was bus. It was bus. <laughs> Is that right? It that was, was bus. bus. Yeah, it was bus. It no was cap. Bus. No, yeah, no, no cap, cap bus. <laughs> <laughs> was... Nice yeah. bitch. Uh, and, and we're there at 7 a.m., blah, 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 blah. And then she's cold. So I give her my jacket. Now I'm cold. That's what I'm saying. We've solved the problem. You bring a. Get, I'm telling you, go online and find one of these little jackets that you can stuff, like almost like a like a one of the Patagonia ones. Yeah, you can stuff into a tiny little thing, <laughs> okay. and then you just put. You have a little purse. Okay. Uh, you have a little man purse yep. that you bring around, and it's your jacket purse. Wait, back to positivity. I'm going to solve that problem too. Oh shit! In my family, we have a uh, we have a family motto. Now we do have a six year old daughter, so it's a little bit easier to take us seriously when we go. What's the Castro Leggero family motto? We we go be. Calm kind work hard try your best be positive so oh, that's nice. uh so that is uh i think having a, a little motto like i jason's, love that jason's never going to be as positive as you I, I, that's just not the way you're built but having a reminder system where we go in this family we we choose positivity as an yeah. ethic that it, that just makes awareness true like sort of on the surface that's yeah. for, for me too my problem is i'm super messy I'm like a mess, and it drives Natasha crazy. She it really makes her like hate. I would say hate me. Um, <laughs> and so, so uh, like talking about the problem all the time didn't make it any better. Yeah. But having a consciousness, I'm now going to this like coach for for like being ADD. And yeah. and the co- I don't even know if the coach is helping me, but but going to the coach is helping me because it's like we we go. In this family, we try to pick up and we try to be positive. It's like, it's a vibe. Uh, As the kids say, it's a vibe. (laughs) It's a vibe. It's a vibe. Well, so back to your problem. Um, I believe, so Jason's really messy. I believe when someone... Fuck, fuck, fuck. We're we're the same, man. I'm sure we are. When someone is messy and the other person, it upsets them. I think it's something that the person that's getting upset has to work on. Because if someone's messy, it's just... It's not, they're not doing it intentionally. They're just messy and they're doing stuff. But if it's making you mad, then it's up to you to clean it up. Uh, so like sometimes when you're mess, like the kitchen thing bothers me. Yeah. I just clean it up. I'm not going to go yell at you because you're not doing it to hurt me. Well, you have a 
I would say, slightly different vibe from my wife. <laughs> That is not the answer. You also have a slightly <clears throat> different vibe from my girlfriend. Yeah. Really? She would disagree with you pretty strongly. Uh-huh. We have so like, this is this is the this is the like the modern versus old school breakdown. You've got a very old school trad old wife. School, yeah. You got that yeah, trad yeah, wife yeah. energy coming. Yeah. You know about trad wives? What's it called? Are you familiar with trad wives? Tell me. Oh, this is an internet thing. You this is a pool you guys are gonna jump into. Okay. So there's a whole world of uh, influencers now. Um, and I, I can't believe it that I'm here telling you about influencers. Yeah, yeah. But, but this is a, it's a universe. They're kind of, I don't know if I would call them right wing, but they're, they're a kind of a spiritual offshoot of right wing, uh, yeah. um, in internetosphere. Yeah. And they're these women who are, they're trad traditional wives yeah. and they're like, they're all hot yeah. and they're all like, I bake, I bake a pie for my husband and then I bend over the minute he gets home. Yes. Like my job, and, and I'm not saying that's literally Wait, you. I'm it saying sounds that, like that is her. <laughs> that is her. There's a whole thing? You are a trad wife. This you is, are a trad someone wife. Someone stole my yeah. personality? No, I, no, actually what happened is you just had a guest on your podcast that gave you an insane new source of revenue, okay? <laughs> because you're about to become the biggest trad wife influencer Whoa. in the Los Angeles area. But they're they're fascinating because they, yeah. they're, they're all beautiful. You're in. And they all have this, um, th- like it's because it's like a '50s wife aesthetic, mm-hmm. you know. And they're I like, love that. they're making a casserole, and they're like, they're traditional wives, but they're very modern kind of influencer energy on the internet. That's what she does. She 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 cooks. She cleans. Crazy. And, yeah. Uh, I wake up early to get ready. Yeah. She. Oh yeah. She gets up very early. And uh, oh, what time you get up? Like eight, seven. She if like, if we have to be somewhere at eight, then I try to get ready at. Like she seven. won't go anywhere not looking her best. What time do you get up? I get up. He at gets eight. up early to okay. work out, so then I'll try out. to be ready by the time he's done working out. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't get a trad wife. <laughs> yeah. I got a a cruel wife. I think is what they're called. <laughs> it's a, a different cruel? kind of. <laughs> is it hard to work uh, work with your wife? Or is it fun? No, it's fun. Yeah. I mean, honestly, like I said, and I was uh, like, you know, being flippant when I said, you know, the, uh, the I, sex was the drug. It was, it was true. I mean, yeah. I was I was dating and it, that was really fun about the road. Yeah. But there was, there's no comparison. Doing the road with Natasha, especially when we bring our kid, it's like you're hanging out with your favorite person and your other favorite person. Yeah. And then you do your favorite thing. Yeah. And then afterwards, you're still, you're hanging out with your favorite person. It like, That's I so felt nice. like I matrixed the the whole system of stand up when we started touring together yeah. so no um, it can be tense but Natasha and I've worked together for so long on so many different things I was a writer on her sh- on her Comedy Central show uh-huh. uh, we've done this podcast is we that where you met? together no we met in the in, the, in the trenches the clubs, yeah. it could have been you man it could have been you and me God can you imagine <laughs> if we were together our house would suck dude <laughs> I think you and I would kill it no we would kill the property value it, we, it would just no, be like a mess I, and we'd be on top I. of a pile of garbage going fuck <laughs> I'd, I'd be I'd be more of a, I'd probably be the more the base I think so you could fly. You mean you'd be the top? No, I'd be I'd be your your home center. That's oh, so I would nice. be I would be the kite and you would be the anchor. I'd be the anchor. <laughs> no way! I don't think I so. I think so. We'd both be trying to kite. That would be the problem. Yeah. We'd both be trying to yeah, fly. You can't be an anchor. You're you're such a kite. Yes, but I, I find him so funny that I'd be like, all right, you go. So you don't find me funny enough. <laughs> so you don't think I'm funny. Oh, no. <laughs> now who's being negative? Your problem. Hey. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I think it's hard. I think one of the hardest things probably doing like a podcast with your wife, too, is like when you uh, sort of like when you like maybe roast her. Or she roasts you, and maybe like feelings get hurt. Oh, that has happened and does happen. That's my other my other marriage. Uh, my last marriage, I think you're that collecting marriages. We, how I many you got? I, we was that? How many you got on the board? I have been married six times. That's not true. No, no, no. no. This, this is my second. <laughs> I'm, I'm his second. second. Okay, okay, we, that's, we, that's, we, that's we respectable. Married, that's normal. Way, okay. We got married a few weeks ago. The two of you? Yeah. yeah. Oh, congratulations! Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, and things are going great. But uh, but I think that was my first marriage. I think we suffered from that kind of like the. Uh, throwing, I'm being funny. Yeah. But I'm also, uh, wow, I'm hurting her feelings right now. That happens a lot. Bad. I'm sure you can relate to this. <clears throat> you do this thing where you think, <clears throat> excuse me, you do this thing where you think, um, oh, anything for content. Yes. And then all of a sudden you're in the bit and you're like, damn, this was a, this was sensitive and I didn't realize it. Like I thought we were coming and this was going to be a fun mm-hmm. zone. And actually this is a hurt zone. Yeah. And, and that can be really difficult. I mean, thank God for editing. 
<laughs> like, yeah, yeah, we've yeah. edited a lot of stuff out that was just like you've, you've missed a lot of stuff but too. We, put, we put things in we, we, we leave things, yeah, in, where, leave where there's, things in where there's tension because i think that that's interesting for people to see yeah, and it's honest it and it's real um but sometimes there's things where i'm like i've stopped we've stopped a podcast in yeah. the middle yeah. have you got have you ever stopped no we've no. stopped in the middle and gone okay let's just stop because we've gone into a zone where no one's having fun anymore. I have a general rule, which is she can make fun of me and I don't make fun of her. Ah, uh, interesting. I have a rule, which is that Natasha says is the reason that, well, one of the reasons that she married me um, is she was asking about material on stage. And I said, absolutely no limits. Like, I don't mm -hmm. care what you say about me on stage. I don't care, like, at all. Right. I said, what you say about me at a party? Uh -huh. In front of my friends, uh -huh. yeah, I'm, uh, that's very sensitive. Yeah, you can make fun of me if it's fun, but if you are on, you if you see Natasha's act, I mean, yes, I've seen it. It, it seems like I'm a complete piece of shit. Like, <laughs> and I know she's well, honestly, just she's have, only kidding. She is just kidding. I haven't seen it actually since she got married to you. Yeah, I mean, she yeah. she talks a lot of shit about me, and what I. What did she say about you? Oh, um, well, <laughs> I, I don't want to do her material, but what like she a lot of it is about like how negligent she thinks I am with the child she's like uh, you know I went I went uh, I went to go shopping the other day and I left my child to say can you give her a bath and she she's like I came home and she had the child in the sink with the dishes now <laughs> that's true but it's not it's not as simple as that you know I mean, of, course, it was, of course but anyway she makes fun of me a lot and I don't I don't mind that at all yeah I, yeah I, I even like it it's just for her comedy though it's like there's can't it's be fun any, if she there's two, to. if there's yeah. two stand-ups in a, in a relationship, it's not fair. That happens a lot to people who marry non-comedians, and sometimes it happens to two comedians where it's like, you can't say that about me on stage. I just can't limit her in that way, yeah. And I c couldn't accept her limiting me in that way. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say anything about her. I wouldn't be cruel. I mean, I'm defensive of her because I love her. Yeah. But I, I, I think those rules can't exist between two comedians for it to work. Yeah. And how did it make you feel when she took her top off the other night? Oh, I, I was furious. I was disgusted. I was angry. <clears throat> what was upsetting was that TMZ didn't call me. Did they call her and say, how do you feel about what happened? I'm like, hello, is anyone going to call? No. <laughs> Uh, to be sincere, I didn't. I liked it. I thought it was sure. so cool and punk rock. And it made, me, yeah. it made me go. I wonder if you took your top off. How that would make me feel. How how would it? I don't think you're not the jealous. Also, you're a trad wife. You're not taking your top off. Yeah, I, I really wouldn't. You take the top off the cherry pie, put a little bit more filling in, put the lattice back on, and bake that bad boy. Um, it it, it I thought it was like awesome, actually. Like, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, it is I'm awesome. I'm also from a world where I'm. I was raised in the Bay Area. I. I been to Burning Man twenty four times. I've twenty four. You know, yeah, twenty four times. Been once. Oh, you have? Yeah. Oh, cool. I wish I'd seen you. I'm sure I was there the year you went. What year did you go? Uh, I went once for Comedy Central. Uh, Comedy Central sent you? Yeah, but I don't <laughs> remember funny. what year it was. It was so long. The years have added up. But my one memory of Burning Man was I was in a tent. I was sleeping. And I couldn't fall asleep. It was the first night I was there, and I heard this like pulsating music. It was yeah. Like, dum, bum, ding, dum. It sounded dope, and I was like. <laughs> I was like, fuck. I was like, maybe I'll go check out the rave. It know? slapped? Yeah. Oh. Nice. What's up, man? And I, and I walk and I walk and I walk and I walk forever just towards the music, towards the music. It's like, you know, three in the morning and I'm like, this is going to be insane. I got there. It's just, just a DJ, no one else. There was nobody there. <laughs> nobody there. I have a. <clears throat> and I don't understand why he's, why he's playing uh, <laughs> pumping music at three in the morning. Get some sleep. So then the morning we can go and have a good time and ride around. It is fun. Really funny. You know what's funny about, about fun. Burning Man? I, by the way, I brought, I'm not to do a oh, different, yes, not yes. To do a different so plug. Oh, yes, yes, I'm sorry. No, don't be sorry. Now, I, I like where we're going. To, I looked last night to try to get the book on audio. It's not out yet. It's not out. It's out January 30th. When does this bad boy drop? Monday. Oh, it's it's available Perfect for pre-order. It's available for pre-order, but yes, it'll be out, I guess, what, next week? Yeah. But it's a, it's like a memoir of the six kind of universes that I've lived in, the worlds that I've what embodied. Are the six? The six are... Um, AA and the 12 steps. I got sober yep. when I was 15, like I, like yeah. I said. Um, the Hasidic Judaism and Judaism. My dad was like a born-again Hasidic Jew, and I was raised nine months a year, a regular secular Oakland public school kid on welfare that would then fly home to New York every summer and like cosplay as an extra on Fiddler on the Roof. Like <laughs> I would just literally be in a Hasidic neighborhood where all the kids really? spoke Yiddish as a first language, and I would be this like secular kid like lost and with no clue what to do. Um, ASL and sign language interpreting. My parents are both deaf, and yes. I was an ASL interpreter mm -hmm. for like 15 years. Um, uh, 
uh, raves. When I was 16, I started uh, going to raves, and then I started throwing them, and I started DJing at them, and then I started selling ecstasy at them, clean and sober, by the way. And then finally, and then Burning Man, I, I went for the first time in 96 when I was 16. I used to work there for like 15 years. I worked at Burning Man and helped put it on. And then finally, Stand Up, the world that you and I yeah. uh, uh, share. But, um, but the Burning Man thing, you know, what you're describing, uh, the DJ is a little different. I don't want to get back to Natasha's tip. But um, <laughs> there's something about Burning Man that's so massive scale, yeah. right? Like, as you know, it's just like the biggest, craziest things you'll ever see in your life. And then it like it like reflects, ref, it like sort of contracts all the way. I just made up a word, reflects. It contracts all the way to the smallest little experiences that can be just as magical. Like there's a story in the book that I talk about. Me and my friends were walking around way deep, deep out in the, in the playa at Burning Man one night. And there was a light that we saw, like way out. We just started following the light because we had nothing else to do. And all of it, all the way out in the middle of nowhere in the dark, it was like three in the morning, was a man with a teeny spotlight doing a marionette performance for nobody. <laughs> and and then all of a sudden when we arrived, he was doing it for us. Like, And it was this like magical, all the raves the, and all the art cars and exploding trees and uh, that you see at Burning Man. They're just, they're not more magical than that one man doing a little teeny marionette uh, performance at three in the morning for whoever happened to walk by. Yeah. Hey, did you ever see the tub of Hurl when you were there? What is that? <laughs> it was a hot tub. <laughs> and, oh, God, it, that sounds horrifying. It was a hot tub on wheels that spun. Oh, that sounds so fun and so Burning Man. That, yeah. <laughs> Burning Man, I loved for uh, because especially in the earlier years, it was like so funny. It was so wild. And it yeah. wasn't like the peace and love stuff that I found in the rave scene, yeah. but it was like real comedy, but like kind of punk rock, hardcore comedy, like yeah. pranks that were dangerous and almost life-threatening, but that were the most funny thing you'd ever see and the wildest experiences. There's another story in the, the book I talk about. Uh, I was at a party once at Burning Man at this uh, party called Jub Jub. And I was sitting next to these two beautiful women and they're talking and I was sort of talking to him too. And then all of a sudden they like, they leaned over me and started to make out. And I was like, oh, okay, this is going just the way I wanted it to. And then, and then they, they, they collapse on top of me and they start having like 69ing on top, like fucking each other. And I, I start to reach in to go, you know, like in my yeah. default position as a man, like this is, this is, I'm, this is an in invitation. And as my hands go towards them, I have this like secondary realization. I was like, Oh no, they're not inviting me. I'm not. I'm. Not, I'm just uh, furniture. Like I'm. This is. Listen, it's a lucky seat. Don't get me wrong. I'm lucky to be here. But I realize like this isn't for me. This is on top of me. But I'm not invited. And so I just sort of respectfully sat there, allowed them to do their thing. They finished, and then I got up and I never washed those pants again. That's really funny. Because imagine the girls. Retelling that story, yeah. and they're like, "We tried to have a threesome." With this guy. <laughs> he was and so then he scared. just acted like a chair. <laughs> he was such a bitch. He froze up. <laughs> he just sat meanwhile, there. Meanwhile, I think I'm having some spiritual realization about like the position of men in the world and assuming yeah. things are they're for like, you. We and they're like, "Will you get them? in here and rub our butts, dude? What's wrong with you?" As somebody who you've been, uh, you've been involved in so many subcultures and. You've been kind of like punk your whole life, and now you're where you are in your life. Is it hard to uh, go back to that, or do you, like? I know you still go to Burning Man, right? I do still go, and like you know, um, is it still fun? It's fun in a different way, uh. and and I think like that's a lot what the book is about, and like is about you know my life, and, and not to get too serious, but my life, but before I got sober was, it was filled with like pain and violence and therapy and uh, mental institutions and arrest and and all this horrifying shit and and I when I got sober I was like okay my life's over but I'll survive does that make sense like yeah. I was like I'm fi and that's I'm 15 years old having this realization like it's not a real realization but it's a realization that's based on a broken brain which is like my life's over because the only thing I do in my life is drink and get high and do these things that are, you know, my I, my friends, they went to prison, they're dead, like, they're, it's, I know what I look like, I know I don't look like a guy that should be saying my, <laughs> I, should look, I know I should be saying, my friends are mostly, they're mostly podcasters, a lot of them work on synthesizers, but. Some of them work at NPR. That's right, a lot of NPR guys, but but that's not how I grew up, you know, yeah. I grew up in in Oakland in, in, the, in the 80s and 90s, and it was like, it was gnarly, and, and I felt so fucking 
fucked up that the time that the time when I found the kids who like hang out at the back of the portable and go meet us back here, I was just like, oh, this is my universe. You know, that was the first experience I had where I walk through a door into another world and go like, oh my god, I'm different. I'm I found my superpower. I found my people. Yeah. Like this is me now. But I sl- but that was, you know, I was 12 years old. And I started getting high and dropping acid. And, you know, it was just not the right, I was not physiologically ready for that kind of life. You know yeah. what I mean? So by the time I'm 15, I'm in and out of rehab three times at that point. And I was just so fucked up that when I got sober, I was like, okay, I will, I will sacrifice fun and I will stop living, but I will, uh, but I will not die. That was yeah, yeah. the deal with the devil. That's that all I made. at fifteen. That's at fifteen, and I was ro- I was so wrong, but be- I was I was blinded by uh, the the size of my dysfunction. At fifteen, it would be impossible for you to realize how much life you had left. It, well, exa- I'm saying it completely. It was like yeah. a full false realization. It was like it, like I said I say in the book like if you if you get sober. And you say, okay, now I'll never have anything to do. That presupposes that all you ever do is drink and get high, yes, right? Yes. Like That was the problem. I couldn't see past, like, mm-hmm. my little mess of a life. And then at about six months sober, I, like, looked up and I realized, like, I'm a child. Uh, you know, I'm a teenager. Mm-hmm. And I've got, like, the rest of my life ahead of me. And And it was like I had been pulled out of a stormy sea and it was like now you are on land again and you can go wherever you want so that's what I dedicated my life to was like going wherever I wanted and finding these other little portals where I could walk through and go oh man this is my universe and these are my people and these are my superpowers and I found all these superpowers uh, in the rave world and in the burning man world and and, uh, and and you did all that sober and all of it was sober yeah wow yeah I've been yeah burning I'm one of the few people that's been to burning man that much that was and that didn't forget at least large chunks of what happened. I saw 200 people bathing naked at Burning Man too. Oh yeah, I've seen that. There's a great. I just walking by, 200 people bathing. No, there's a great camp at Burning Man um, <laughs> that the people from Doctor. That's not your vibe. No, they no, weren't having I think sex that's cool. either. No, well, that's that's why it doesn't bother me that Natasha did that. <laughs> because I don't have right. that view because of the way that I was raised and the world that I come from. I don't have the view of like nudity equals sexuality or th- them's my titties or, uh, you know, like, yeah, you're it's, right. it, it, uh, it's not. Take con- your top off. Yeah, yeah. Go, right. I would appreciate it. No, but it's, <laughs> right. it, it, it's not. When I saw what she did on stage the other day, to me, I thought, what a fucking badass. Yes, like, yes, yeah. That's yes, awesome. That I didn't think uh, like. That's how really, I look at it. Guys, really look cool. at my titties. My wife titties. My wife titties. Those are my titties. Like, I just like, I don't have that in me. That's good. Yeah, but That's there's a great really place good. at Burning Man. Um, a, a bat, uh, the people at uh, Dr. Bronner's put on every year. Dr. Um, and That's Dr. The... Bronner's. Yeah. I love Dr. Bronner's. They're the best. Actually, I'm on there. Um, they send me chocolate and soap sometimes. They I'm make on chocolate? They, chocolate? they make chocolate. It's good chocolate. <laughs> and you know what's cool about Dr. Bronner's? They're an ethical company. Yes. Really ethical. Yeah. So much so that the CEO is never allowed to get paid more than something like 12 times more than their lowest paid employee. That's cool. So that every time he gets a raise, everybody in the entire That's company nice. gets a raise. They're a really cool company. But they put on this... Um, this dome um, every year where you wait in line for hours. And when you get to the front, they, you are asked to take your clothes off. You don't have to be naked if you're not comfortable, <laughs> but you have to be like close enough to naked. Wait, this is at Burning Man? This is at Burning Man. Okay. So you wait in line for a long time because a lot of people, they don't have showers. They don't bring showers. Yeah. Right? You know, people are living on this like hippie sustenance yeah. thing. And you, so they go to this. They wait in line for hours. You get in. They say, okay, take your clothes off. And then they start kind of rounding you up. And pushing you towards this big, like it's like a, um, it's like a shipping container on wheels, um, and but it's transparent. It's, Rounding you up, that's not no, no, good. It that's gets not worse. good language for you and I, most it, no, it gets as two worse. Jews. No, it gets worse. It gets worse. This is where I'm going with it because then you're naked and you're being sort of pushed toward this, I would say, box car. And you get into the box car, and then all of a sudden, like the people from from the camp, they leap on top of the shipping container with these hoses, and they start hosing you down with this like peppermint foam, and you're what? you're packed in, like packed close, like scrubbing kind of nuts to butts with the uh, the the, uh, the the hippie like That's didgeridoo really player funny. behind you, and they start spraying you down with foam, and then they spray you down with water, and it's like your one shower of the week, and yeah, Jason. It feels <laughs> vaguely Holocausty, definitely. But, Holocausty, but kind of like the fun Holocaust. The fun it's like, Holocaust. and then after they sh- they hose you down, you survive. 
they they kick you out of the the box car and then you all go the old everybody starts like dancing to like psychedelic trance <laughs> naked and scans a room for their Burning Man threesome that night. This these stories and more in Subculture <laughs> Vulture. <laughs> would you ever do something like that? I would like have a group shower or go yeah. to Burning Man. A group but, shower. Would you take your clothes off and go into a group shower? Okay, yeah. I'm going to hold on. I'm going to jump in with a question on the question cuz I don't think that's a fair question. Okay. Cuz the question I think has to be would you do that at Burning Man? Yeah. Cuz yeah, if I said to you, if you said to me, I mean, I've been 24 <laughs> times. If you said to me, "Hey, we're going to go down to Lancashire for a, a uh, for a group shower in a box car." I'd be like, "What the fuck is wrong with you?" No, like absolutely not. I would do it at Burning Man if yeah. everyone was like just to have a full experience yes you would actually speaking of Natasha we went I hope she doesn't mind that I tell this story we went to I, I've been with her like three times uh, and then I pushed it too hard she came pregnant once she'll never go again but anyway <laughs> like the second time we went we went to the to the the uh, the camp I'm telling you about yeah. the Bronner's camp and we waited and I, I think I had a hookup and so we skipped the line but we got in there and Natasha looked around and she was like oh no like definitely no, right. and so we left. Or I think maybe I did this shower. You stayed. I think I stayed. I was like, I'll be right out. Uh, <laughs> the shower is like a repeat thing. Like this happens it's every, every day. time. Yeah, it's every day. It's multiple times a day. It's a thousand times a maybe day. Maybe I'm just uncultured, but I don't know anything about Burning Man. Like what? What? What is the? It's a big party in the desert. Where? Where is it? Where does it happen? You'd like to know more about Burning Man? Is that what you're saying? I don't is know that, anything. Oh, I just a- answer the question. Are you'd like to know more about Burning Man? Yeah. Well, there's a book that's just coming out. Uh, it's called Subculture Vultures. It's oh, available right. right now for pre-order or maybe even order depending on when this drops. Do you have drops. a copy I can actually <laughs> look at? I can actually... Uh, I can exp- I mean, if it's interesting, I can, ex- I, can explain, I can explain Burning Man uh, and I guess what I'm it just is. asking from the standpoint of like, I don't know anything about it. Other than I know that it's a place where people go and listen to music and do crazy things but well, like is like, it more it, of a festival it like is it more you want me to of te- like... you want me to tell you the cliff snows version is this uh, yeah uh, okay explain it starts i'm sorry to do this no no it <laughs> starts in it starts in the 60s not burning man but acid acid was introduced into the, the into society and people dropped acid and it it exploded society into like a thousand different directions right. the hippies the uh, civil rights movement the anti-war movement uh you know i'd like to buy the world a coke all this different stuff and obviously the civil rights movement isn't only fueled by acid it's fueled by many other things as well but anyway one group <laughs> <laughs> One group of them. Thank you for you know Dr. King. Yeah. <laughs> he was just out there at raves. I have a dream. I have many dreams. <laughs> I have a vision. Uh, I have a dream that one day we will not be judged by the color of our skin because it's all psychedelic rainbows. No. But but the 60s, the acid movement spun off and one particular spin off was Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters. So you know, Ken Kesey was a writer in the 60s and he was one of the, the kind of the beat writers, right? Jack Kerouac, Ken Kesey, and then there was like yes, people yes, like yes, Ron. Ram Dass and, and T- Timothy Leary, who took acid, and they became like spiritual leaders. Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters took acid and said, forget spirituality, forget loving your neighbor, let's go see f***ed up shit. And they got into this van, into this bus and they traveled across the country dropping acid and like trying to like see what madness they could create on the road. That that experiment led to this little organization in San Francisco called the Suicide Club, which was a um, which was a secret society in San Francisco that that you had to join, you had to be a member, and they would do weird experiments, uh, social experiments, just for them, right? Like they climbed to the top of the Golden Gate Bridge and had high tea, or they like infiltrated the American Nazi Party. They would do all these weird things, but it was just for them, right? They spun off into another group called the Cacophony Society the Suicide Club, rather, into the Cacophony Society, which now they were a new organization, but they weren't secret. They were public, and they did this thing where they would do these events called culture jamming that were not for the secret society members. They were for you, right? So you ever sure. seen like a flash mob? Sure. Or, uh, or a, um, a billboard that's been like graffitied to look exactly the same, but it's a subversive message? Sure. Or SantaCon, right? Yeah, yeah. All of those things are, a, are from the Cacophony Society. They invented that concept, what they called culture jamming, right? They would do things like you'd be on a bus one day and you'd, the bus would stop and onto the bus would walk a clown. And you'd be like, okay, clown, whatever. I don't know why he's not in a tiny car, but I guess he's taking this bus to work. Then the next stop would come on, two more clowns would get on. You'd be like, why are there three clowns? <laughs> the next stop, five more clowns. And by the time you're getting to your destination, the, the bus is filled with clowns. It's all clowns. And you're like, what is happening? So that feeling, <laughs> that what is happening feeling, that is the essence of culture jamming, right? That's what they created. At the same time, 
Um, and they started doing these events in, in weirder places where they could get away with more and more. At the same time, there was a guy named Larry Harvey who, who just was, went to the beach in San Francisco one day and set a, a, a statue on fire to like get over a breakup or something. And people came and they liked it. And he said, I'll do it again next year. The next year, people came and he lit it on fire. But there were like 300 instead of 100. The next year, there were like 600. And then the next year, they, it was so many people that the cops showed up. Uh, and the Cacophony Society showed up. They heard about it. They're like, this sounds like our kind of good time. So the Cacophony <laughs> Society's there. The cops are there. And both of those people had a pivotal uh, uh, influence on the, what was to be Burning Man. The cops, because they were like, you can't do this. It's against the law. And they were like, what law? And they're like, well, I don't know. They don't really have a law specifically about burning a two-story man. But it feels but wrong. It does feel illegal <laughs> on some level. We're shutting this thing down. And the Cacophony Society came up to Larry Harvey and said... If you want a place where you can do whatever you want, we've been doing these weird events in the Nevada desert, in, in uh, the Black Rock Desert, just outside of Gerlach, Nevada, about three hours outside of Reno. There's no one there. There's no laws. It's kind of a wasteland. Why don't we take this statue and drive it up there and burn it there? Mm -hmm. So that's what they did. They drove it up there. And from the thousand people that were on the beach, maybe 300 people followed. And they went up to Black Rock City. They hoisted the man. This guy, Danger Ranger... He drew a line in the sand and he said, if you walk across this line, you are entering a new reality. Kind of exactly what I've done over and over again in this book. Uh -huh. You're coming into a new zone of reality and you will never be the same. And this is what we call a temporary autonomous zone. So it started as a ritual, basically. It started, yeah, as an, 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 as an accident of history, of a perfect kind of synchronicity of events. And yes, it started as a ritual. And then ne the next year it got bigger, and the next year it got bigger, and then all of a sudden it became this wild fucking party. Like what you went to when you went with Comedy Central yeah. was really different than what I went to when I went for the first time. I was yeah. 16. I heard there was a rave in the desert. I drove out there to go to this rave, and I got out of my car, and I go, I don't know what the fuck this is, but it is not a rave. It, it was dangerous. Mm -hmm. There were drive-by shooting ranges. Somebody died like before I even arrived there. People got oh. run over. It was they were setting fires to buildings on on raw on raw oh, desert. Shit. I mean, it was the craziest thing what I'd did ever you do experienced. For food? I brought you know I brought um, this uh, this amazing newspaper grill that my mother had bought on QVC that was supposed to be able to grill newspapers, uh, grill hamburgers in five minutes using newspapers. The thing did, <laughs> like did the not work. Like the newspapers is the fuel? Yeah, you just crumple it up, throw it in, and it's a bar. It didn't work like at all. Oh, wow. But I, that's where I was at. I was like 16 years old, no life skills. I grabbed a bunch of like free papers, a pound of uh, hamburger meat, a bunch of water, <laughs> and the amazing newspaper grill jumped into the car and just drove out to the desert to see what wow. was waiting for me. And that's how Burning Man started. And that's what it's become. It's become this thing that's bigger and lamer in some ways than it used to be. But when I arrived, it was like a one. It was a a a, a kind of tonal shift from the universe. It was a different. So world. how do you feel when you see somebody take a private plane into Burning Man? Does that bum you out? It's not. I don't feel bummed out right. about. I think what you're getting at is like a private plane. I mean, I'd take a private plane. That sounds amazing. I'd be going. Yeah. I'm 44 and I've yeah. been going for 24 years. I, I'm not trying to. But there are different to camps. Slum it. And one of the camps is completely rich and all rich people and had CEOs and stuff like that, yes. right? I, I thought that's what you were getting at. Yeah, yeah. And it's not that it bums me out because, yeah, there are camps. It's become this place. It's still pretty wild and crazy, but it's not what it used to be. And it's become this place where, like, Silicon Valley um, – CEOs will do their like and your company retreat there instead of like going to the Cayman Islands. They'll go to Burning Man and like ride around on a Segway and do coke or whatever. And they do this thing where they're so rich they'll pay you know forty fifty thousand dollars to create these things called plug and play camps where it's the, the luxury of their real life is like brought to Burning Man mm. and they go in and they they have curated experiences and somebody built makes them nice costumes and they are always on their little Segway. Kind of defeats and, the essence of it though, doesn't it? Well, that it's not that it bums me out. It missed me why you would go to an event where the essence of it is to like have this through the looking glass experience mm -hmm. of some other way of living and just port your life there and right. have your life waiting for you there right. so it's, it doesn't bum me out i understand it right uh, i just think it's uh you're missing out on such a magical experience if you do it like that i remember one time i went to get water there and um I remember seeing like a child, he was like four or five years old and he was just standing next to a guy with a big piercing in his <laughs> balls. <laughs> sure. And the kid was eye level <laughs> with the guy. And 
and the you know the kid doesn't know, and the guy's just standing there, and it was I was just like, oh my god, this is. But see, I was raised in the Bay Area in the in the eighties, and I was around nude performance artists and weird hippies yeah. in hot tubs my whole life. So to me, like, I've never brought my kid. Yeah. But I would love to. Natasha is not interested in her coming. Yeah. But yeah. I just think like if I was six, seven years old. I mean, yeah, I'm gonna push her away if I see a cop piercing. But uh, but <laughs> but it's like such a crazy wonderland. Like it was fun. It, and, it really I, is something. It, it, it's something else, and and it's not for everybody, but but it definitely was for me, and it definitely changed my life. But that's what Burning Man is now. It's this. no, that's actually that's super helpful because I feel like I would always see things on social media, um, and hear things that are just like out in the ether of like Burning Man, Burning Man, this 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 this, and then you just like it's a video of a guy being pulled on a fucking skis in the desert in a burning car it's like random shit. i'm like what is what this is this, it? Well, like, the what is going on here the difference between it and a, and a and a festival and a coachella there's nothing for sale there's no headliner i mean there might be a famous person uh djing but you can won't, people you, just like can artists just be like i want to play burning man this year and they yep, just pull up and yep, you pull up and do whatever you want you can have whatever experience you want you could go out you could take drugs and go see diplo dj and then chase after women and then get on an art car and then do coke or you could get you could be 70 and go and get up early and run a marathon around Burning Man and then go to a jazz show and then take a nap in the, at sunset and then go to a meditation workshop or you can go and be a kid and stay in Kidsville and uh, only go out Kidsville there's a, there's a, there's families there there's old people there there's young people there in a lot of ways it's the coolest thing that I do all year um, yeah. but but it's it's definitely less dangerous than it used to be right yeah, you're feeling pretty good about the uh, the EDM music at 3, 3 a.m. now, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. People, well, it sounds drive, like you had the same experience. Drive-by shootings you, and you, stuff. And... You went and saw a marionette puppet show at 3 a.m. that he was performing to no one. But that's what I'm saying is like, you know, I've seen some of the biggest spectacle I've ever seen. And I've seen some of the most, like, one-of-a-kind, beautiful experiences that are, that are just for me. And, like, it's all it's – all, what the it, what the experience is it's just like accidental and honestly that's what a lot of the book is about is about these sort of accidents of a life like walking through yeah. the world like getting i describe it as like pinball like life used to be like pinball and like i love the internet but the internet has changed the pinball experience of life from like you accidentally happen to stumble onto these people and now this is what you're into uh -huh. to it's more of a like delivery system like the internet is like no no this is kind of what society is. It's like, this is what the hot music is. Like, just open up your phone and it's there. It, this is what the culture is. And this used to be, culture used to be more of an accidental path, I sort of feel mm -hmm. like. Anyway, let's get back to Natasha's titties. <laughs> did, you, did you, um, do you feel, sometimes when I watch the podcast, I get the feeling that you guys are like very anti-internet. Natasha is very anti-internet. Yeah. I can't be anti-internet. Uh, because I use it every night from 11 to 11.15 p.m. <laughs> in a very specific way. No, I, I could never be... <laughs> I could never be fully. She's really anti phone, and she really does believe yeah. that phones are are like destroying society, and and that's a hard thing to argue with. You yes, know, it, it is. It, it it definitely is having a corrosive effect on society, but for me personally, because I have deaf family, yeah. because growing up it, before. Um, when I was growing up, if I like locked myself out of the house, I was just out of the house. Like that was it. I would just have to sit there and wait for my mom's deaf ass to pull around the corner to let me back in. Uh -huh. And then came uh, Blackberries, and I could text her like, "Hey, mom, if I'm cold, let me in." And then came webcams, and I that was super cool for us because uh -huh. my we grew up super poor, and my mom's got like a really popular OnlyFans, and so that was cool. That's a joke, and that was. Uh... <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> no. But then now it's like I can sign to my mom like on my phone now. I can call my mom. I can call her right now and say like, hey, I'm at Jason's podcast yeah. and like it's going well. I'll see you for dinner tonight. Like the technology has changed. Well, that's different than the internet. That's but it's not. It's all. It's I think I was getting it's having technology. Well, technology is great. I mean, to be able to talk to your mom, that's insane. I, I think what I was getting at is like for like the show that you guys do. Yeah. Uh, I, I would love to see like more shorts and more like you guys like promoting the show because it's mm -hmm. so good. Thank you so much. And I much. feel like there yeah. might be a little bit thing there that's like, well, we don't want... Well, what do you mean? Like, you mean like, um, like, 
more content from the podcast? Yeah, 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 like, like oh. shorts and stuff like that. We what think do you, mean you guys shorts? should be on the uh, like, like YouTube shorts. Like, why, why aren't they on like Why aren't they on every t- like we love the like, show we drove so back much? From, well, let me we, ask you guys a question. What is TikTok? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll ask you. We drove Can you back explain from, TikTok we drove the way back, you explain? We drove back from Burning San Jose. We were yeah. in San Jose. And we drove back, and we, we, she goes, oh, uh, she goes, you want to listen to a podcast? I go, yeah, of course. She goes, you, we should listen to this Endless Honeymoon with Dak Shepard. We listened the whole way. Oh, yeah. the Dak it was a fucking yeah. amazing, amazing podcast. It was so good. I got him hooked. And then I was like, how come I don't know about this podcast? Listen, find me some Gen Z guy to uh, well, that's what you need. Ch- chop it up. Hey. What's up? I mean, what are you, <laughs> you're busy. You're right here. Yeah, he's not <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I'll, t- I'll talk to my man later. Yeah. That's well, all well, yes. I'm saying. I mean, listen. The internet is uh, is. is it, I used to. How long have you been doing comedy? Uh, Probably as long as about me. About six right? months. No, nah, it yeah. feels. But when did you start stand up? <laughs> Every day. I mean, I, I've been doing it off twenty and on years for twenty years. Twenty years. Yeah. I used to see this. Um, this kind of archetypal comedian that would uh, that would do a bit. I, I probably saw ten versions of the bit. This bit about uh, cyberbullying. Yeah. It was like an old man usually who has kids, and he goes, "Kids say they're getting cyberbullied. I got an idea. Log off." <laughs> right? And I just I remember looking at that and going, "Oh, this guy doesn't understand what the internet is. Like, like he doesn't understand that that, that there is no log off. We are <laughs> yeah, like right. like my calling my mom really and funny. social media clips and uh, the 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 2024 election and new fashion and new music and it's all yeah. it's we have we are halfway rope. We're no we're 10 percent robot already. Like the uh-huh. internet is us, right? Yes, it is. So so yeah, I mean, figuring out the right way to weaponize it or to to use it, it's all, it's a mystery. I mean, you're you're good at it. Well. I just pointed a picture frame. Look at this. this. Now that's the internet. It's a TV. It's now a that's TV. the internet. It's actually a TV. What? Uh, what's a TV? Wow, it's the technology you guys use. What were some of what were some of the things you got in trouble for when you were a kid? Stealing. How did I get in all that trouble? Yeah, stealing. What'd you do? Vandalism. Um, I was definitely a tagger. Yeah, I, I was definitely. Cool. A, were you any good at it? it? No. And you know what? <laughs> I I had a a realization. I, maybe I'm lucky and maybe I'm alive because I had these little flashes of like clarity that were I shouldn't have had at that age. Yeah. But I had one cl- flash of clarity with graffiti where I was looking at my tag on the, on a wall and I go, I am not good at this. <laughs> and <laughs> and I'm like, I'm risking arrest and I'm yes. doing a crime that doesn't pay and I'm not on the road. Never that, understood graffiti. Well, I'm never just, got it. I get it. If you, I never for got the people, it. For the I drive by good at it. and I'll see an ad for Netflix and it's like, Jimmy Three, it's like what? <laughs> well, Jimmy Three's good. He no is good. Him. But no, I mean, like, why? There's no there money is, in there's it. There's one why. If you are tagging and you look up and you go, "Damn, I'm good. I am becoming a sophisticated artist. This is leading somewhere. Uh, I could see that. I see. But I was like, for me, I'm just a vandal, and <laughs> and I was like, I think I'm not going to do this anymore. And this is before I got sober. This is before I, I was like, this. I'm out for this. So graffiti, I was in trouble for um, fighting. Uh, Fighting fist fights. Oh, tons. All yeah? the time. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, and with I got, who? Who with, would you fight? With, with, you? E- with rival white kids that thought they weren't white kids. You know, I mean, that was, uh, that was basically. Yeah, and my own friends. I have this gr- horrifying story where my, fr- my friends were so awful. One time we were all drunk and there was a, some new kid that came to, and hung out with us. And my friend was bullying it, beating him up. And I run over because he's like my one of my best friends, and I like grab him, and you've seen this video, right, where the guy's, come on, leave him alone, man. And he turns around, and he punches me in the face. <laughs> and I'm like, Aww. ow, what'd you do that for? And I run off crying. That was my big problem. I'm always, I always cried. Every time I got in a fight, I would start crying. So I was like, I'm this little wannabe gangster, but like, I'm just like, I, would, I was like a, an inch away from crying. So I start crying, and I, I run off, and he runs over, uh, like, you know, five minutes later and he's drunk and I'm drunk and I've got a black eye and he's like, I'm, he's like, I'm sorry, man. I didn't, I'm sorry I punched you. And I go, well, yeah, you're sorry. I was fucked up. Fuck you, man. And he goes, fuck me. And he punches me again. No. Yeah, I'm like, you beat me up for me not being happy when you apologize for beating me up. Like, these are the kinds of people that I was surrounded by. Are you in by. touch with anybody anymore? I am in touch with some of them. <laughs> he's actually cool, you know, in that particular guy in the book, in my first book, Casher in the Rye, which is, I describe all of these uh, the years before I get sober, kind of my wild uh, uh, youth in Oakland, I, I warned him. I said, look, I wrote this book and, y- you know, I tell some stories about you and, you know, it's a comedy, so I'm making fun of you a little bit. And he just goes, I'm sure I deserved it. Whatever yeah. you said, I probably yeah, deserved yeah, more. Yeah, 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 but people grow up, yeah. you know, and he, grow he, he grew up. But some of us didn't, you know. I, I really I really admire you. I mean, I think for anybody that's watching, like, 
anybody that doesn't have their shit together that's young, the fact that you pulled it together is, it's incredible. Well, thanks. Like, how? <laughs> well, and you didn't have a support system either. Did you just have like a guiding thing inside you? No, like I had a, 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 a what are, an a overbearing mother is what I had. Oh, you did. And, oh, yeah, I had a mom that was there the whole time. So you were you were going out causing havoc and and and, and, and breaking her heart and breaking her heart. And what she did in my family, therapy was like God. You yeah, know, therapy took the place of religion in my family. Is she Jewish too. She is. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but she's more therapy than she is Jewish. Yes. Like so, when I started to act out, even when I was really young, before I really started getting in trouble, but I had like learning problems and behavior problems. Uh, that was really the issue too. I came from these, you know, I'm this one one of the few white boys in Oakland public schools at the time. I got these deaf parents. My dad's super religious. My mom's not religious at all. I'm feeling all these weird differences, but then it starts to manifest itself in like behavioral issues in class and like you know getting uh, getting in trouble and getting into fights in, in school. And my mom started to push me towards like therapy yeah. and so by the time I was I was four I started therapy and by the time I was 15 I was in therapy eight eight times a week eight there are not that's wild they don't have that many days you doubled no. up I doubled up, I doubled up. Uh, yeah. so you had a two a day one day was two a day I had five days a week of um re of after school rehab and then one day a week of individual therapy, fam one day a week family therapy, and one day a week of group therapy. So that's eight. That's how we get to the magic number of eight. And I and I was on I was on psychiatric drug. I'm not uh, yeah psychiatric drugs. And I was like getting tested with all this stuff and like you know fighting and violence. And then the Oakland Police Department like knew my knew me like my first and last name. Anytime I'd get seen by them, I get like searched on site. And I went to I went to court oh, for biting my, my mom one i mean the whole thing was bad and you never want to <laughs> I didn't your mom sued you that, that's yeah. really cool she put me it was like a youth it was like a youth diversion thing so yep. instead of like going to jail but i so I had to do community service and i yeah. remember the fellas would be like you know we're like what are you in here for man and so one dude's like grand theft auto what about you robbed a liquor store what about you white boy Oh, I bit, I bit my mama. Yeah. yeah, you guys better watch out. I'll bite you too. <laughs> and then what turned it all around in terms of like you got into comedy, I guess, right? Or did you get into DJing first? Well, comedy came, comes much later. But um, When did you start doing stand-up? How old were you? I was, I think, 21 or 22. Okay, that's, and, that's pretty young. Yeah, it was like 2002. 2000, 2002 is when I did my first set. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that, with Chelsea Peretti, right? With Chelsea, that's yeah. That's another weird accident of history, which again is like... The magical accidents of, of a life are what this book is all about. And like, yeah, the stand-up is like, I was in school, I was studying um, playwriting yep. and acting in college, but I had no I had no idea that, I nothing was about stand-up. I know it wasn't a part of my upbringing. I just wasn't, were you always a stand-up guy? No. Like when you were a little kid? Yeah, I didn't have that part of me. Not at all. And I was at a semester abroad uh, in college and it got uh, shut down because uh, of political stuff that was happening in the country. And uh, and I, I just decided to go to New York that year for because I had nothing to do. And so I went to New York and I called Chelsea Peretti, who's an old friend from Oakland, uh, who I went to middle school with. And she went to high school with my uh, with my brother. And she was like, I'm doing stand up now. And I was like, what do you, what is that? Like, I mean, I knew what it was. I was like, you do stand up? I didn't know people, I didn't know humans could do stand up. I knew Eddie Murphy could do stand up, but you do it? Like, how? What is, so she took me to this show and at Pianos in New York. Pianos. And uh, uh, Patrice O'Neill and Sarah Silverman were on the show. Wow. And I was like, I describe it in the book, like, they came out and they start doing these jokes and you know, I've been writing these like fancy monologues, you know, like with like emotional cores to them or whatever. And they're just doing these jokes about. And I remember Mike, uh, Patrice was making fun of Michael J. Fox. It was like yeah. the week that he had been diagnosed. And I was just like, what the f what is this? Yeah. Like what it's it was so transgressive and so awful on some levels, but also mm -hmm. like scary and a lot like Burning Man, you know, mm -hmm. like dangerous and exciting and kind of like, what the fuck am I looking at? And this feels wrong, but it also feels like uh, vital and incredible. Mm -hmm. And um, and I said, uh, and then the next night, she, Chelsea was doing a show. Mm -hmm. And so she invited me to that. And then uh, I had this experience watching Patrice and Sarah where I watched these like titans, yep. you know, these like gods uh, doing their thing. And then I watch her and she's so funny. And I'm like, wait, you're, I know you, you know, like you're a person. Yeah. And you're funny like the those weird gods last yeah, night. Yeah, like yeah. she's really funny. Then it became like, Oh, I could be this. Yes. And then I said to her, 
okay, you're coming to San Francisco in August. It's June at this point. I'll, I'll write five minutes of material. Will you take me to an open mic? And then she did, and I did, and I got on stage, and I did, as you know, like well enough to do another yeah, one. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then fast forward 20 years, you know, this is my second book. I got a career. I've got a wife. I've got a kid, I, a wife that I met in, in stand-up, a kid that wouldn't exist if I hadn't done that set that night, mm -hmm. if I hadn't gone to pianos, if I had, instead of going to New York, I'd gone to London to go check out Big Ben. I'd be in a different universe right uh -huh. now. I wouldn't be on your podcast. Sliding I, doors. Yeah, sliding doors. Yeah. That's what the book's about. I remember seeing Patrice in New York at Luna Lounge, and I remember being, I was really young, and I remember being blown away just at, like, what he was saying. Yes, he, he was, was. I remember he was doing this bit. He was like, he was like, he's like, if, if, if you're a white guy, and you're walking down the street, and you see a bunch of black guys, he's like, yeah, run away. <laughs> <laughs> run away. <laughs> I just thought that was so, he's like, but, yeah, I always, of course. I always, Move as fast as you can. I always describe Patrice as like a, a philosopher of piece of shitness. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. it was like the highest IQ and the angle was uh, the best experience for me because I got to open for him um, years you later, did? Uh, which was a cool experience. That's really you know, cool. The sliding door thing yeah. where all of a sudden the guy who was the Titan is now I'm opening for him. Right. And I rem in San Francisco, and it was like the craziest experience was watching a crowd in San Francisco, very liberal crowd. Mm -hmm. You know, he would walk some people uh, automatically who didn't know what they were getting mm -hmm. themselves into. Some, But then the people that would stick around, some of them would just be straight fans or love every. But there was always this demographic of people at the show that would stick around who weren't really into it, but were like begrudgingly over the course of the performance, like kind of having to like surrender to the fact that they were in front of a master. You yes. know? And then they would start <laughs> laughing. And that was always, I thought, that's more powerful than that's like killing best. in front winning of a bunch of over, like, Winning a crowd over. Yeah, but he was so good at that. I saw Dana Gould once. He was at the improv. He did his whole set and he was bombing. And then he just did the set again. He started and it he over? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's incredible. <laughs> I always say, listen, <laughs> if I see a friend kill, that's fine. I like it. I love the craft of my stand-up friends. Sure. But if I see a friend bomb, who I know is funny, that's the best experience in comedy. Yeah, watching yeah, a truly yeah. funny human being just eat shit. I think like, that's not what I, I didn't understand that for song when I would be out there bombing. And then my friends would be like, that was great. And I'd be like... No, it wasn't. Yeah, I it was so painful. Yeah, and they're like, yeah, but we loved it. Well, wouldn't it be crazy if you could figure out a way? Do you still do stand up a lot? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We did. I did shows last year. Cool. And I'm trying. I'm gonna get back out there. I wouldn't think. it be cool if you could figure out a way developmentally? And I don't think you, I'll ever get there. Where you could experience the joy that your that your friends are experiencing watching you yeah. figure out a bad set while you're ex having the bad set. Because I'm such a I'm such a uh, and a lot of this is in the book too. Like every world that I've gone into, I've chased after it the way I chased after drugs. Uh -huh. I went after it like I'm chasing the dragon. And the first time I was there, it was magic and it diminished a bit and I kept chasing. And like, so there's a part of me that own, that gets so affected by a bad set because it's not like the drug experience. Like I bought bad drugs, you know, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. But I would love to get to a point where I can experience, and to some degree I have, um, not when I'm actually bombing. When you're actually bombing, it's almost impossible to be uh, enlightened enough to be like, even this is joy. Yeah. But when that feeling of like, this isn't going my way, but I'm going to like, I'm going to do something to make it fun for me. Yes. Somehow I'm going to do that. Yes. That's one of the best feelings in comedy. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I a, know it's what a you challenging mean. set. Like a, you, what you said, it's killing in front of a hot crowd feels great, but winning over a bad crowd feels like you're a god. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, I guess that's 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 the trick to it is to try to figure out those moments. I had a set in uh, in Malibu. Remember when we went to Malibu? <laughs> yeah, I was crying. First laughing. of all, Moshe, a set in Malibu oh, already no, already bad. No, no, absolutely. <laughs> was it Eddie F show? No, no, no. I I know Eddie F. It was uh, first of all, it was at a. Like Aviation. a really high end boutique, yeah. yeah. Aviator Nation. That that's what that that's where Eddie F does his show. Oh, it is. It wasn't Eddie F's show, but that place. I right? get the vibe, man. You don't even need to paint the picture for your listeners, but I get the vibe. Uh, all wood paneled, uh, two hundred dollars sweatshirts, and then in the other room, like. It's such a cool venue, though. Cool, cool venue, cool it's venue. Awesome. Kids yeah. with money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kids absolutely. with money, which already is like sure. it's not your money, it's your dad's <laughs> money, and your mom's money, but. 
But, uh, and I went up and I think I said a joke about Adam Sandler, like how people didn't understand comedy in Malibu and that got a laugh. And then after that, not great. And then the guy who was filming, he came up to me after and he was like, that was so good. And I was like, no, so everyone it wasn't. also, I think it's important to know that sometimes certain venues, like, you All I heard hear... was you laughing. No, no, no. I literally heard hear... you laughing the entire time, <laughs> which is basically no. if Motion was there. This no, is what no, Motion's no, no, talking no, no, about. No. Watching there's somebody some, bomb that some, you like. There's some venues where you can't hear the back laughter because everyone on the back wall and the are, other comics You are a good. sweet wife. I mean, you are a good, up. loving woman. She's, she's it's good. just the first two rows. Like you brought up a Pani. terrorist organization and everyone clammed up. I did at, bring up Hamas, yeah. But everyone else. <laughs> oh, you're blaming Malibu. You're blaming Malibu? Yeah. You, didn't bring, you didn't drop the Hamas bomb until five minutes into the story. I mean, thinks me figured out the problem. <laughs> uh, but you had no, I had a listen. friend come up to me and he was like, during when everything was happening, he was like, he's like, I'm going to, he was Jewish and he was like, I'm going to go over there, I'm going to do something. And I was like, to Israel? Yeah, I was like, what are you going to do? You know, you're not going to, and then, and then in the next moment in the conversation, he's like, well, what's going on with you? And I go, I go, well, I go, my, I'm trying to get my ex-wife to pay for my kid's school. Uh -huh. And he goes, well, you want me to go talk to her? And I, <laughs> and no. I go, no, you, you handle Hamas. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, which I thought was a good joke. But. So, that no, is but funny. Then, You're like, I don't uh, think you have the negotiation skills to be <laughs> yeah, able to yeah, deal yeah. with my ex. <laughs> but I think maybe Israel-Palestine, you, yeah, you could probably get some really so good work funny. done there. Um, now, listen. I did have a realization in my comedy where there was a huge shift for me. Please which is, tell me. Which is that I, and this is a, it was a long time ago, it was like my job on stage is to find a way to have fun while I'm up there every time. Right. Every single time I'm trying to kill or trying to like get the material out or this crowd I don't think is going to like my thing in this way so I'm going to deliver it different it's always awkward. It all, I mean, it, it, it usually, I've been doing comedy long enough that it's usually fine, mm -hmm. but it's not magical when I'm like up here. But yeah. like when I like sink down into like, let me have a good, like fun for me. Yeah. They like it. And, yep. and it's what, it makes it more fun for them too. So uh -huh. like that is a challenge because when you get, you know, nervousness or like, you know, oh, I gotta, I gotta do well tonight. It's very difficult to like be loosened in the moment. But the degree to which I can be like just there experiencing the show and finding out what it's about at the same time that the audience does, like that's where I'm in my sweet spot. I see. Okay, that's a key. You've opened for Louis C.K. too. Did you learn anything from watching him? Well, I opened for him. A uh, long well, time ago, right? Yeah. I mean, um, did I learn anything from Louis yeah, yeah, C.K.? Yeah, yeah, He's so good. I mean, he he's definitely a great comedian. Him. He didn't, he was not, I would say, uh, a take me under his wing. Um, <laughs> right, right, get, right, right, right. Drop knowledge on me type of guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, no, I wouldn't say I learned anything from him. You know who was, I learned from? Yeah. I remember Colin Quinn early Col on. I know Colin Quinn. Colin came up to me after I opened for him with like a bunch of notes and tags and stuff no. like that. And I just thought that was like the coolest. I used to be the receptionist at Saturday Night Live. Really? Okay. So, and there's tons of funny people there. Will Ferrell's there. Adam Sandler's there. Everybody's there. I mean, they're all the best, whatever. And he was the funniest person in the hallways. He is, he is so funny. A genuinely funny person. They would all come up to reception and do their bits yeah. for me. You oh, know? that's really, that's cool. Yeah, I was a kid. Tracy Morgan would come up and do the bits. Oh, that's Will awesome. would be in character. I mean, he was always the best. But sorry, say yours. No, just that that I thought was like such a, it. that feeling of like, why are you doing this? I'm I'm yeah. absolutely nobody. Yeah. And you're... The 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 guy from Weekend Update, like to me, I was like so touched by that, um, and you know, I don't know if I, who I learned from exactly. Mm. Uh, more people that I've become impressed with. Was I impressed with Louis' comedy? Of course, I mean, yeah, it's hilarious. Right, right, I was impressed right. with a lot of people, but um, who I'm, else? Who else you're impressed with? Who do I love? Yeah, who who you impressed with? Um, well, like? I do think Chelsea Peretti is one of the funniest. She's great. Uh, Todd Berry makes me laugh every Todd time. Todd Berry. I was telling you about Todd Berry the other day. He makes TikToks now. Yes, okay. he does. Yeah, yeah. About it's so cat. funny. And it's like, I'm the most famous person in the world. Uh, uh, Brent, <laughs> Brent Weinbach. I remember Weinbach, being very yeah, early yeah, on in Brent comedy Brock. and uh, and and seeing him. Is and, his act still weird or is it oh, more? It's, it is so is weird. It, it's still weird. But he's such a killer. That's what's so cool about Brent. Right. Is that he is the weirdest comedian you'll ever see. I mean, mm -hmm. he's weird but you put him in a club any club and he'll kill it's not like really? so weird that it doesn't translate yes yes once in a while people are like i don't get this but yeah. it's not 
bazaar where it can only exist in a like you know record store in Brooklyn. Like yeah, yeah, I've yeah. been to Texas with him. I've been to you know I've done club comedy clubs with him. I've done colleges with him. Like he, cool. he's a killer. He's a weird killer. Yeah, and I like that. <laughs> One of the things that I love about you when I listen to the podcast is you're like you have hobbies. I do have hobbies, and you're always trying to. Um, it seems like you're like trying to be a man. Yes. And do manly things. I There is some part of me that is because of how like sort of not manly I appear. Right. That I get this like. That's I get, what I love. I get great. I mean, you can't imagine the pleasure I get when I walk out of a bathroom having done like an extremely bad um, plumbing repair that we're going to have to definitely call a plumber for. <laughs> my hands covered in caulk and I look up at my wife like I'm the, the monkey in 2001 and I go, right. man, fix thing, you know? <laughs> yeah. And it's really a, a, because, yes. It's because and don't you have a, um, like a car? What does he have? A I have car. a car, yeah. No, no, he has no. A, don't well, you, what do you, I, don't you have like might, an RV or I something? I think you might be referring oh, yeah, to my no, o, my, o, my, my Overland RV. I believe is yes. what you're my over my truck. My uh, yeah. My, what do you do with that? My Chevy uh, twenty five hundred HD <laughs> with a lift kit. And, and you work on it. Yeah, I work on it when I can. You I mean, know how look, to like work the engine and stuff. And <laughs> listen, I don't work the engine, but I I change. Uh, you know, I can change the oil and I okay, can do okay. minor rep- the minor repairs. I do feel like you can put there snacks is, in the back for well, later. There is definitely um, anxiety <laughs> about me and masculinity that uh, sure. that is it, is why I do the things I do. But more than that, you say I have hobbies. You know, in, in the Castro Leggero family motto, we say what? What do we say? Work hard. Work hard. Be uh, nice to people. Be, not, be, kind. be kind. Be kind. Try your best. Uh, be positive. Have fun. Have fun. That's really, really close to my religion. Is like have fun. <laughs> like, and, like squeeze. Life is so short. Yeah. And I want to like drink it. I want it all. I, you know, I want to <laughs> squeeze the towel of life so that when I'm like about to shuffle off, like the last, I don't, I don't want any part of me to be like, I wish I had seen Diplo live. Like I want, I want it all. You know. Yeah. I want to live. Good for you. That's really inspiring. You're very inspiring. Oh, thank you. And you're so smart. You read a lot? I do read a lot, yeah. I I read a lot for this book, dude. Did you go to college? I did. Did you go to college? I didn't. Well, I did. I was I was but, too smart for it. I thought. Well, I mean, fair enough. I, I'm I not, really thought. I'm not That's sure what a wise decision answer. it is. I've never used my degree. I have a degree yeah. in religious studies. But I thought my my years were done of like an all nighter with like stacks of research books. Yeah. So this book isn't just my memoir. This book is also a history of each of the six scenes that I've lived in. It yes. starts at the beginning and like kind of what we did with Burning Man. So I had these stacks of books, like research books that I was, the whole pandemic, I was just like reading books and doing homework, basically. So like I put a lot so of learning into about this like thing. the Burning Man story. You just told, making sure I got things right. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. We got to read, babe. Read I this read book. Like I a suggest. book a week before, <laughs> before we got together, I would read like a book a week. What, what's some of your faves? I love like Eckhart Tolle. Sure. I love, I also love like well, fiction books. That doesn't make me feel good. Like, you stopped reading stopped once to, you met me? Yeah. She didn't need to anymore, brother. You're enough. No, you are no, a fountain no. of We're knowledge We're also always and doing info. stuff that like, I've, we've never been like, hmm, let's sit and read. Like we we're should. always you so guys, busy. Okay, I got an idea. Why don't you start a reading club with your podcast? Everybody, all the listeners, read the same book. Let me think if I can come up with a suggestion. Yeah, give uh, us a book. Uh, oh, what about Subculture Vulture? <laughs> <laughs> let's start with that one as the first one. And then you guys can do like a you guys can do an episode but recap. Like one of my fantasies, Jason, is to like before bed, like we each like one night I read a chapter out loud and like we sit in bed. Oh, and that's then the sweet. next night, like you read a chapter and like that's what we do instead of like instead of the endless honeymoon podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 do them all, do it all. <laughs> like I think that okay. that's one of my no fantasies. Endless honeymoon. We're done. <laughs> one of my fantasies is to finally divorce myself from the endless honeymoon podcast yeah no i i think you should keep listening and uh, but i love this idea of yeah. reading a book together. me and natasha are trying to read a book together you are and, and, and it's cool because it gives you something you a new thing to talk about both read the book i think both talk. read the book and then get together oh, and, really? and chit chat yeah, but you do you yeah I, i'd like it like you. we can do like voices we can make it fun i think okay. we should read it out loud you guys are got I like extreme this new- i can see the print you guys got extreme newly married energy. Let me just say, you know, I think we'll read, we'll do voices together. Most, I'm worried, we'll make it man. fun. <laughs> I'm worried because it, it's like it's so good uh, yeah. that I'm worried that like, how do I how do I keep it going? How do you I don't. keep the magic going? You want my real my real <laughs> Eckhart Tolle wisdom? Yeah, you don't. 
It's not possible. Magic cannot stay in its same form. It doesn't. It's not like that. Listen, It'll no, 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 grow. no. Hold on, hold on. I'm not being negative here. Magic doesn't stay in it. I hate to keep saying this, but that is what this book is about. Mm-hmm. That magic shifts. Magic, the salesman. Like, no, but it's true. Magic yeah. shifts. It, you, when yeah. you first experience that feeling, yeah. you know, when I was single and right before, I had a lot of difficulty finding. You know, Natasha's the first serious relationship I've ever had. Is that true? I, I, yeah. I know that. Yeah. She's the wow. first serious relationship I've ever had. And I was, I was, in, it was impossible for me to find love. And I read this book. Um, called uh, The Road Less Traveled um, by M. Scott Peck, I think is, I think I think that's who it is. I've heard of it. I could be wrong. It's an old self-help book from the old, olden days. And basically he was like, you know, when we chase after that feeling of euphoria, I mean, mm. not, you guys are married, so it's a little bit different, but when you're dating, that feeling of euphoria, you know, you hook up with a person and you go like, oh, I want, I want to see them every second. Oh, I want to drink their blood. I want to like, be, everything they say is so clever. And it, that is a, that is a drug that mm. is a that is not love that is um he describes it as lust i don't to me lust is different to me lust is horny but it's it but i get what he means it's like it's a it's emotional lust like i want to drink that person whole right mm-hmm. he says that's not sustainable that always goes away it will okay. always go away that feeling of like uh, that frenzy right and then after that frenzy goes away what is left is is either love or not what love is is caring enough is caring about another per- this is his words not mine uh, caring about another person's spiritual well-being more than your own yeah. right what oh. it's like that feeling of of um this is my my partner and and I will you know, I will defend them to the end of the world you know does that always mean that you feel euphoric? Of course not. It can't. It can't. Mm-hmm. It will wear off that mm-hmm. feeling of euphoria. And then it'll come again yeah. in some different form. There will be a new spell. Mm-hmm. There's not going to be the same feeling. It, it, that's drugs to me. Uh-huh. You know, that's drugs. You go to the drug, you get high, you go, that's the greatest feeling I've ever had. You get high again, you go, it's a little bit less. And then you get high 20 years later, you're like, I barely even feel high, but I have to do this because it's all I know and it makes me feel safe. Right. But but the experience of being in a in a real relationship, as challenging as they are, I think is that it changes and the euphoria turns into something deeper than euphoria. You know? No, nah, we're just gonna be madly in love. Like, <laughs> I'm not uh, saying not yeah, madly yeah, in love. No, I, madly in love is yeah, real. I you're don't just think it feels different. It, it has to. Why yeah. would you want it not to? I mean, why would you want it not to? I feel like. Why would you want a static experience of one of the most challenging and complicated uh, emotions and relationships in your life? I You're, just want it to be like this forever. Is your feeling uh, towards your children the exact same as it was when you brought them home? Or has it morphed and changed in different ways? But you still love them just as deeply. I see. It just changes, yeah. I think. Now listen. What's interesting is when is when I met her and I had like I was in, I was in love with her from the minute I saw her. And what's interesting is like to know her now and be like, it's like different. It's different. It's just ten times better than even what I could imagine. It's deeper. That's like you're yeah. bu- you're building into the um, the foundation. Mm-hmm. You are you are laying the pylon. But but the idea. I mean, listen. Do you sometimes think you should have been a rabbi? I. Oh, you'd make a good rabbi. His brother's a rabbi. My brother's a rabbi. Oh, and I'm I a comedian, that. and that's the seesaw of the Jewish life, <laughs> brother. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> no, I never wanted to be a rabbi, but um, but you I could there, be though. You'd be good. There was some universe in which I was about to be like a Jewish studies professor, yes. and I just took took a left turn and, and went and hung with Chelsea Peretti. Yeah, hung with yeah. Chelsea. <laughs> no, really. Yeah. And 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 when I think about the life that I was like maybe going to have, mm-hmm. it feels like a like a a foreign like an alien. That person doesn't exist. It's so interesting. Like what could have changed to make me go this way or that way? What life I could have had? But like I am now. I have this life, and I'm now. You know looking back on it through the lens of this book and going like, so that's what destiny was. Yeah. I didn't know. I mean, I don't really believe in destiny, really, but I do mm-hmm. believe that in destiny at, in the rearview mirror. Yeah. You're going like, whoa, I had no idea. All these weird, painful, positive, awful, lovely, magical, incredible, terrible, awful, stinky feelings were all kind of leading me to this place where I'm just glad to be where but I am. That's what I try to tell my kids like when they have like a, a rough time or something, I'm like, I can't really put it into words. Maybe I'm not smart enough, but this is all great. Yes. Yeah, like this is making you stronger. How how was um, going to the Emmys and winning an Emmy for you? 
Now that was like enlightenment as well. <laughs> now, you, if you watch the podcast, he he has his Emmy with him. I love on that the podcast, podcast. sitting there. It was, a, and it was just sitting there. Every the, set is, the set is quite bare. It's it's just the two of them on this big beautiful couch, and then in the middle is just like an Emmy sitting there on I mean, the wide shot. Look, I'm not. I'm pretending to be enlightened, but the truth yeah. is, I have a lot of negativity too. And when I got sure. nominated for the Emmy, I I really did have the thought like, I'm. This isn't. I'm, we won't win because I'm nominated. Does that make sense? Like, like the fact that it's me means yeah. it won't happen. Like, I have that feeling, yep. that doom and gloom of like imposter syndrome kind of yep. thing. And uh, I, I, it, I wasn't even. I had a gig that weekend in San Diego, mm-hmm. um, and I was like, should I go? Should I go to it? And they were like, yeah, you can go. Like, because it was it was the daytime Emmy. I mean, obviously, if it's like the prime time Emmys, it wouldn't have even been a conversation. But I was like, anyway, I was like, of course I'm going to go. Why right. would I not? I mean, I should yeah. be there. Like, of course I should be there. I can't even believe I got nominated for this. Right. I didn't even remember. I did the thing. And you, it was like two years ago. And it kept getting pushed because of the pandemic. And I knew it was really a good thing, a good project. It's yeah. uh, it's called the uh, Recipe for Change, Standing Up uh, Against Anti-Semitism. Yep. And this was three years ago. It LeBron was just, James tr- produced it. LeBron James produced it. And it was really cool and really an awesome night. But I never think this could be that. But anyway, whatever. We, I go to the thing. Um, and uh, and I, I remember this guy came and he... We, we we didn't we were seated at the table next to our pr- project because of like a seating thing because yeah. of a last minute seating thing, and there were two empty seats at that table, and so Natasha and I came and sat there, and this guy comes over and he's like, but this is my seat, <laughs> and I'm like, oh well, we just left that table right there. If you would like us to go back, we will, but like this is our pr- our table. These are are the producers for the thing. Like, and he goes, oh, okay, thanks a lot for telling me where I can. And sit. Appreciate that. Oh my god! And it was like so, like over the top and hilarious. We were like, we literally started this by saying we'd move. He huffed off and went and sat down. And the whole time we were just talking about him. It was like, you know, we kept saying like, because the hosts came out and we were like, this that guy should be the host. Like that would be hilarious, right? <laughs> and we were just talking about him. And then, and then all, then all of a sudden our category comes up and we win. And I was overjoyed, but I was like at least 25% of my joy was in the fact that he was there and saw motherfucker we won bitch. like we won and that was us you talking shit to an Emmy winner now bitch. and we went we did our thing and we went back to the red carpet to take photos and stuff oh and another funny thing happened yeah. we were on the red carpet and uh, and Natasha was there and they kept asking Natasha on the way in they're like oh Natasha can we get some singles of you yes. and I'm like hey I'm fucking <laughs> I'm nominated. I'm, I am nominated. I This is my day. Like, I'm not normally on a red carpet. I, I'd be like, that's cool. She's yeah. the star. Yay, whatever. I try to stay humble. I'm a fucking, it's my night. It's me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, uh, that was hilarious already. But so we get in there and I'm so happy that we won because that guy had to see us. And then we go back to the red carpet. And now I'm real happy because all the photographers are trying to get singles of her. They're like, oh, oh, cool. You know. And now you're getting Now, now you. Too. Oh, yay. Snap, snap, snap. Yeah, you got that in Imagine my horror, because what the way it works is you win the Emmy, you go up on stage, you do the thing, then they bring you down, and then it's like a, a very slow conveyor belt of the projects that have won, and so it takes a while to get down the, to get down the the red carpet. We get down to the bottom of the red carpet. I guess who shows up at the top of the red carpet? The guy. The motherfucker won an Emmy too, no. right after us. That's why he was all gassed up. He wanted yeah, his Emmy. He knew he was. <laughs> Damn. It was the That's only thing really that could have taken away my joy at winning that Emmy was, was that, that guy, guy walking through, ho- hoisting his above. Did you make a speech? I didn't. I didn't make a speech. Didn't the pro- a speech. producer did. Yeah. Um, you know those pictures too. They they need pictures of the girls. That's what no, no, sells no, no. the Listen, magazines. I, right? I ninety nine <laughs> times out of a hundred. It's not that she's the star. Don't give a shit. Like no, I'm <laughs> truly like don't give it. Look, the red carpet is the worst experience. Okay, war. But then right after <laughs> war, like the red carpet is humiliating all of the time, you know? Yeah, but then, there yeah. Was, but it's the worst. But when you're like actually nominated for an Emmy and it's like people are kind of like, yeah, 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 you're cool. That was. Have, that, you ever, have you ever been set down the red carpet and someone's like, do you want to do the carpet? And you're like, no, 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 I don't want. And they're like, no, 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 you should do it. This has happened to me multiple times. And then they send you down. And then they don't know who no one, the fuck No one knows who you are, oh. and no one takes a picture of you. The worst. Don't. The worst. No, I have never seen that with you. I, I've, I know. Do you know why? Because now I'm with you. And no, they no, want no. A they picture. don't give a shit about me. 
No, Yo, you're, that's you're pretty. Not I've experienced no, no, no. They want no, a picture of you. They'll not be like, they'll that's be why. Cute. That's so cute. So you look so beautiful. Just Jason? Just, no, I, that's not true. Them? Last time they, they asked for just you. That. I've had this experience you're talking about where you're like, you're so, I'm so uncomfortable in that situation. Anyway, yeah. they go, do you want to walk the carpet? And I'll go like, oh, I don't need to. I'll do whatever. And they go, well, you can do it. And I go, oh, okay. And like, <laughs> yeah. And then I go, and they're like scribbling my name on a piece of paper with a sharpie, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and then people are just like trying to read it. And my name's not phonetic, you know, so they're not people, easy to spell. And they're just like, uh, uh, oh, oh, okay, and yeah. you're just like, so now I'm just. It's like a, a true. It's a walk of shame, unlike any That's other. That's really funny. Yeah. But anyway, I'm very grateful to have that thing. It's like, you know, what's cool about it? What? Uh, it's permanent. Yes. It's like in my past. Like it, you can't yes. un. I cannot they can't be un- take it from you. It cannot un- they can never take me. it away. Like much like unlike Millie Vanilli and the Grammy. They cannot un me. I am now. Yeah. I am now forever. Well, you never know. You never. Yeah, know. I guess I could get in a lot of trouble. <laughs> you could do something really fucked yeah, yeah, yeah. up. But you know what? Actually, really fucked up doesn't get it taken away. I would have to have not hosted. Yeah, That's yeah, a, yeah. They took the Grammy from Millie Vanilli because they found out they didn't sing it, not oh, because they were bad guys. Like, that's true. I feel like I could be a pretty bad guy and still be like, well, I mean, I still hosted it and won. But anyway, I'm. I was super honored, and it was. You know what was cool about it? It was cool to have done it. For a project that I thought was really cool yeah. and meaningful, yeah. and had uh, a, a sort of a, a positive effect, maybe on on the on the world and on 100%. the universe, and so that was nice. Well, this has been amazing. You really brought it today. You brought you brought it. Uh, this is a real comedian in our midst. Brought a, and a writer. Go get the book. Subculture Vulture, Moshe Kasher, go buy it. It's out now? Yeah. Well, it's, uh, I you said it's pre-order. It gets, it's out on January the 30th. Oh, by the way, I'm on book tour starting on the 30th. Oh, that'll uh, be fun. If you live, so fun. Yeah, if you live in Austin, San Francisco, D.C., New York, or Portland, or at Los Angeles... So I, just the arty cities you only care about. Well, no, I would have done a, I would have done an endless one. But, no, t- but, let me tell you something. When we went out on stand-up this summer, we were like, we went to the big cities, it was great, and the smaller cities, we were like, oh my God. Oh no! I, it's I tough. Hear, no, I hear you. I, yeah, but I, I get it. Like I, Austin years, will love this book. Twenty years in, you get to this point where it's the Late Show on a Friday night, and you're in yeah. some town with a half-sold Late Show, and you're just like, I think I just need to stay where people love me <laughs> and know who I am. <laughs> but if you're in any of those cities, um, I'm doing all these really cool events, and if you are not, you can pre-order the book and come. I have like an online event on February 26th with uh, six moderators, one from each of the world. So that'll be kind of fun. Nick really Kroll's cool. doing. Uh, Burning Man, Raves is Reggie Watts, Deafness is now DeMarco, uh, Judaism is Alex Edelman, uh, Stand Up is Atsuko, um, and AA is Max Greenfield. It's a su- super murderer's row of people. Up. Anyway, come really see me works. live. I got stand up coming up too send at Moshe Castle. Send all those guests over here for the podcast, please. So. <laughs> What's that? Oh, send them all over? Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, it's an exclusive. But yeah, I got other stand up stuff saw, coming up too. We saw Nick Kroll at the Bourbon Room a couple months ago. and It was so funny. He was so great because he riffed the whole time, but we we got we got seats like right in front. We were on the stage. Uh, we on were the basically. Side have you ever the played stage? the Bourbon Room? Yes. They have these yes, like I wing know what you're seats, about, so they yeah. sat us right in front. And he, do you reckon it? And sucks. unfortunately, yeah. he was like riffing like crazy, killing, 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 so killing. and then he put eyes on me, uh, yeah. and he was like. Was like Jason? He, he did have a really funny joke. He said he said something like, "Oh, and here we go, We're having a, a sort of a Frank Sinatra Don Rickles moment here." <laughs> it was so funny. I hate that feeling so because I do a lot of crowd work. Yeah, you know? I hate that feeling of like looking down and being like, "What about?" I know you. Like, why are you here? You're not I supposed should, to be a person. We shouldn't sit up close because we love to go to comedy shows. I know. No, it's it, I. Uh, the back of the room is the place for me yeah. when I go to a comedy right. show. Right. But yeah, yeah. I yeah. I, I have some live stand up, regular non book. Where are you coming performing up to. on L A at all? Can we come see you? Yeah, I'll be at the actually. I will be at the Troubadour on I believe May twenty second for uh, the Netflix is a joke festival, and then oh, nice. we're doing a live endless honeymoon podcast as a part of the Netflix is a joke festival too. And I'm going to Tacoma and Madison and Chicago and New York. Just come see me. Okay. But you guys too. Oshakasha.com. Yeah, heck yeah. If you don't know how to spell it, just look up, uh, I don't know, Subculture Vulture. It'll get you to the name (laughs) and you can find my website. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. All right. It was lovely. See you next time. Bye, you guys. Bye. Thank you so much.